Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining again. Um, so today's a super important lecture in terms of the material. Um, we're going to learn about maximum likelihood, which is sort of the main way that we think about training and machine learning. And uh, we'll also learn about map, an extension of it. And then towards the end, we'll learn about a extension of regression that will be useful for the next lab. All right, so basically, um, I think when you're when you're done with the course in the semester, after the semester, you'll you'll come to learn that machine learning is really about estimating statistical parameters in a probabilistic model of the data. So we just started thinking about probabilistic models and using them a little bit, mainly for the purpose of, um, so far we really just use it for analyzing bias and, and variance and things like that. But we're gonna start to think about our data as random as well as our, um, our estimator is in some sense a model, probabilistic model of the data. And essentially what we need to do is we need to fit the, st the statistical parameters of our estimator. In other words, the things like the beta coefficients and least squares. So <clears throat> until now we've done it with sort of a heuristic approach where we just said, let's minimize RSS. And we haven't really talked about why we're minimizing RSS or what alternatives might be. And, how we might better choose alternatives if, um, you know, if we know more about the situation. So maximum likelihood will actually give us that explanation and suggest alternatives. Um, and then we'll see map is gonna be a way that we can explain regularized regression, which we just use for feature selection and ridge for dealing with correlation and all that. Okay, so um, so just to sort of start at the beginning, um, let's assume that Y, capital Y, is a random variable that depends on some unknown statistical parameters, theta. Um, so what we could say is that Y is, we'll think of Y as not a discrete random variable, but uh, continuous. So Y is fully described by its, its PDF, we write it like this, capital Y subscript. And then this little dot is just, we save a spot for the dummy variable, which is just sort of a temporary variable we use when we put it inside an integral. And then theta here are describing for us the statistical parameters that govern the behavior of Y. Um, and when we plug in a specific vector here, and we say that theta is unknown, what we're really doing is just coming up with a hypothesis of what theta is and just imagining that. What if those are the parameters? So um, typically for visualization, what we do is we, we plot or we think of PY versus Y, again, for some hypothesized theta. So here's just a really simple example. Let's say Y is Gaussian. So um, to abbreviate the Gaussian distribution, we tend to use this kind of script N or stands for normal, normal distribution. And as we know, Gaussian is completely determined by two statistical parameters, which is the mean mu and the variance, which we'll call sigma squared. This tilde sign means that this random variable is distributed the same as this random variable. So that's what the tilde means. Okay, so all this is to say that, imagine that you have a Gaussian random variable with an unknown mean of mu and sigma squared. So to visualize this, we would like to draw the PDF of a Gaussian. So as you might remember, it looks like this bell curve thing. The exact uh, PDF expression, which is important, um, comes up a lot is this one. So here we see that there's sort of a squaring of y or y minus the mean squared. 
divided by one over two times the variance. That gets negated, put inside an exponential. And then you can think of the role of this scaling term. This scaling term ensures that when you integrate all this, it integrates to one. But the really important things conceptually for a Gaussian is that there's a quadratic that's negated inside an exponential. And that's what gives you this sort of shape. And more specifically, the mu is basically just tells us where the center of the bell curve is. And sigma, which is the square root of the variance here, standard deviation, that tells us the width of the bell curve, right? And so this is something I know you've all seen before. Um, <clears throat> when we think of a Gaussian with a particular mean and variance, we just imagine this. Imagine the bell curve centered at mu. It's width adjusted by sigma. And we're always imagining a plot versus y, which is basically like you could say just the range of possibilities of what the random variable capital Y could take on. So this is telling us the density. You know, if if this value is twice this value, it means that um, it's twice as probable to get that particular value of Y than that particular value of Y. Okay. All right. Any questions before we move on? Okay, so hopefully this is sort of familiar stuff. Now, for machine learning, what's what we really need to do is we need to do some data fitting. To do this, we are going to observe our training data. Let's say that these are our training targets. As always, we have n of them. And let's collect them together into a vector y, column vector y, like we always do. Um, and so let's suppose that all these different samples y are coming from a random variable capital Y with a particular PDF, PY. And this PDF is going to depend on some unknown parameters theta. And what we want to do is figure out how to best adjust theta so that this PDF matches the data we've collected. <clears throat> so basically, an important thing here is we're observe we're assuming independent samples, meaning we're just drawing a new sample of this random variable every time. There's nothing, it's not like we're repeating samples or anything like that. So they're independent. They're all coming from the random variable Y. So we, we tend to say that these are IID, independent, identically distributed samples. And under that assumption, we can think of the collection of them, this vector Y, as coming from a joint distribution that factors into a product of these individual so-called marginal distributions like this. So each one of these is, you know, is just, is this guy. But the point is that we're modeling these all together to describe all these n data points we collected. So we have now a product of these guys. So this is now gonna be, you know, something that if you would like to think of this y as some random variable with dimension n, you can. Um, but the point is that the, the specific vector y is actually data we've collected. So this is this is not something that we wonder about. We, we imagine different values. In some sense, we know exactly what that vector of values is. We have that data. The thing that we don't know about, that we wonder about, is the parameter vector theta. Those are the parameters that govern our model. So when we think about this function for a fixed y, and theta is the variable that, that moves, we call this the likelihood function. Okay, so this is super important. So there's, if just, just to pause and reflect for a moment, if I just say, Imagine this thing, PY given theta. There's really two different ways to think about it. Maybe the way you're more familiar thinking about it is you think of theta as fixed and you imagine varying Y. And that's what we did on this page. We did it with a single variable just to make it easily visualizable. But if you had two, two of these variables like Y1 and Y2, 
you could imagine adding some additional dimension, trying to make some sort of 3D plot where you'd have a what would look like a bump in in two dimensions. Um, but the whole point is when you think about things that way, you're fixing theta and varying y. The other way that's actually more useful to us right now is to fix y and vary theta. That's how we have to think about the problem when we have fixed data y and we're trying to fit the best parameters theta to that data y. Okay, so that's an important distinction. Any questions on that before we move on? Because that's super important way of thinking about things. Okay, just to confirm, if multiplication is replaced with addition, it will be one. Um, don't I just don't understand what you mean exactly by that. You, you can unmute yourself and ask the question if you want to clarify. Yes, sir. Can, can you hear me? Yes. So I was uh, wondering about this relation of probability of y given theta. So right here, yeah. So the relation is given by uh, product of y i given theta. So if we replace this multiplication with summation, so will it be one for all theta? Because probability mass function, we have summation of probabilities one. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I guess, first of all, um, this is not a probability mass function. This is a probability density function. So, mm -hmm. so when you look at the values here, um, the, this, the, the peak is not constrained at one. It can be any number. Um, arbitrarily large. What you need is you need that when you integrate this, that it integrates to one. So that's that's kind of the key normalization property that we have for PDFs. For PMFs, they need to sum to one, but for PDFs, they need to integrate to one. Um, but the other important thing here is, is, you know, this is a PDF of a single YI, but this is a joint PDF, you could say, of, of many different YIs. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure, still not sure exactly what you're asking. Um, so yes, it's it's clear now. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great, great. Yeah. Maybe another way is, so if you integrate each of these, they would integrate to one. And if you did a multidimensional integration of this over Y, where you're integrating over R to the power N, then the integral of this would be equal to one. So maybe that helps. Okay, so um, so yeah, so this is essentially this is going to be the way that we fit the parameters of our model to the data, and this is not just the way we do it. This is like the standard way that it's done in statistics. Okay, so and in particular, we call this maximizing the likelihood because this is the likelihood function. So we're just going to maximize that with respect to theta. And argmax means I don't care about the maximum value of this probability. I want to, I care about the maximizer. I care about the thetas that cause this to be maximized. So that's argmax finds those thetas. And we're going to call those thetas theta sub n up. That's going to be the maximum likelihood estimate of the parameter vector theta given this fixed data we've collected y. Okay, so that is that is essentially maximizing the likelihood is, that's the definition of it. That's what we're gonna do. Now, um, it turns out that a lot of the probabilities that we work with have an exponential in them. This is just often the case. So usually by taking the log of this, the expression simplifies. And it turns out that if you want to max find uh, find the maximizer of something, the point that maximizes something, if you apply a strictly increasing function to it, like a, a natural log, then that preserves the ordering of the point. So if you found 
let's say the theta where this, this quantity peaked, then the same theta would cause a peak in the natural log of this function. So in other words, you can stick in this natural log without changing the arg max, without changing the maximizer. So, and the reason why this is done is it's it's done to simplify things because usually log of p is more easy to deal with than p itself. Furthermore, um, there's often a negation that's helpful as well, like to negate that negative sign is makes it even simpler. And so rather than maximizing the log likelihood, it's actually most common to minimize the negative log likelihood. Okay, but these are all equivalent. They're just different ways, and this tends to be the most uh, convenient in most cases. Okay, so um, so that's really that's the approach. And something I want to point out is when you're doing this approach, you're just saying what's the theta vector that maximizes the likelihood. You're not really bringing in knowledge that you might have about theta in advance. You're you're saying, I don't have any um, particular favoring for one theta over another. I just want the theta that makes that data y most likely. So, and we'll see when we go to math later that this is not the case. That's why I'm emphasizing it now. There's no prior belief about theta that we're using here. It's all about just fitting the observed data, which is the vector. Why? Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so now let's just try to visualize this maximum likelihood estimation procedure. And we'll do this in a really simple case with when we collect only two data samples. And we'll, we'll try to use also a simple model. So the, the model random variable is gonna be Y. The model is gonna be a Gaussian. But we're going to assume that the mean, mu is unknown, but we're going to assume the variance is known to be one. That's just going to be make, make our lives simpler. So in that case, the theta vector, which is, you know, collects all the things we don't know, we want to estimate, is really just the scalar mu. And furthermore, when we just want to write down this distribution, maybe to make it concrete, the Gaussian distribution with mean mu and variance one is given by this expression. So it's a bit simpler than the last one we saw. Anyway, so that's this is our model. The parameter we're trying to estimate is mu. So that means that this is our likelihood, py given mu. You know, mu or theta are the same here. <clears throat> and in terms of our data collection, we're just going to collect two samples, n equals two samples, call them y1 and y2. <clears throat> okay, so the likelihood in this case. Is, is this function. Remember the likelihood contains the data we're using to do the estimation. So that's now a vector. This here was, maybe we wouldn't call that the likelihood because this is just sort of like the, the model for how data is generated either during training or test. Now I've stuck in my training samples and I think of them as fixed. And now this becomes a function of mu. Now it's a likelihood. Okay, so the first step in thinking about the likelihood is always writing this as a product over the different samples I we've collected. In this case, there's two of them times this um, PDF of yi given mu. So in this case, we we know the PDF has that form, so we plug that in, and we know n is two, so it's just a product of these two things. Okay, and now our whole goal is to figure out what value of mu makes this scalar quantity large. So here's a visualization. So here I'm showing uh, three different Gaussian bell curves. They all have variance one, standard deviation one, but they have different hypothesized means. So I'll write this, this is, this is one hypothesis, just as an example, mu is minus one. If, if mu is minus one, then this guy would be centered here. Uh, the center of this bell curve would be at minus one. Another hypothesis is that mu equals one. 
in which case the bell curve will be centered there. Another hypothesis is that mu is 0.2, in which case it would be centered here at 0.2. And there's actually an uncountably infinite number of hypotheses here, um, right? Because it could be any real number all the way from minus infinity to positive infinity. So the different colors in these curves is just to kind of separate them and, and you know, so that they don't get all jumbled together. Here, this is just, this is the likelihood function, or you know, maybe I could say that this is the PDF of Y, because here we're plotting versus Y, for the hypothesis that mu is minus one. This is a PDF of Y for the hypothesis that mu is 0.2, and then this blue one is PDF for the hypothesis mu equals minus one. <clears throat> yes, each curve is a different hypothesis. One, two, three. And these are three hypotheses out of an uncountably infinite number of hypotheses. I can't draw them all. I'm just drawing you three because I think three is enough to get the story across. What I'm really trying to do is I'm trying to visualize how we can do this computation for different mu, because really that's what we have to do. We have to imagine maximizing this over all the different possible hypotheses mu. So now, Let's go one step further and realize there's actually a product of two values from the Gaussian bell curve. Now let's assume that my data samples are actually these two values, y1 and y2, where those black dots are. Um, you know, so maybe one of them is like, I don't know, 0.1 and the other is 0.3, something like that. And so if you think about under the hypothesis that mu is minus one, what is this number here? Well, here's that red curve. Here are the two values of the PDF. So this is just saying, take those two values. Those are gonna be the, the, the heights of those dots and multiply them together to get this number. So that would be the value of the likelihood, the product of those two heights. That's the value of the likelihood when mu is minus one. What about the value of the likelihood when for hypothesis mu equals one? Well, these are the two corresponding values. And now I multiply those two numbers together and I get some other number. So which of the, between blue and red, which one is more likely? Blue. Blue, blue exactly. Blue is likely because the product of the blue dots is larger than the product of the red dots. Okay, now let's look at this green case. The green case, when, when the hypothesis is 0.2, you get these two dots and they have a much higher product than any of the other hypotheses, right? So of these three, the green would be the most likely. And in fact, if you kind of imagine sliding this green curve to the left or to the right, would the likelihood, the product of the two dots increase or decrease from where it is now? So if, if I'm focusing on those two values of Y and I slide that green curve to the right, maybe one of them would go up a little bit, but the other would go down. And when I take their product, it would actually be a lower value than this. There's really no way to make the product of those two dots higher for any possible shift of mu different than this. So this is going to be the maximum likelihood estimate of mu, 0.2, because that gives the highest product of those things. Yeah, that's right, currently at the max, exactly. Um, so this is this is really just trying to visualize what we do with L ML estimation. It's like we we slide, you can visualize sort of sliding around the possible hypotheses of the unknown parameters until the PDF evaluated the data points, the product of all those numbers is largest. That's essentially what what we say when we're doing this. Okay, so, is this making sense or any, any questions on what we're doing with maximum likelihood? Okay. 
not seeing any questions, so hopefully it's good. Oh, is this equivalent to choosing the mean? Mm. Um, yeah, so yeah, so in this in this application of maximum likely estimation, we are trying to find the mean of the underlying random variable capital Y. The data we're given are some examples, Y1 and Y2. They're just realizations of this random variable, right? And you can see, you know, they're reasonably typical, but, you know, depends what they are. But um, in maximum likelihood estimation, you know, you have no guarantee exactly what those numbers are going to be. So those are just numbers, just data points. The thing we're trying to find the mean of, in this case, is this random variable. That's the thing that's generating the data. That's like this physical process that we're only observing it indirectly through the samples we take. Through those samples, we're trying to get at the truth of that actual physical process. Okay, hopefully that answers the question. Um, great, any other questions on anything here? Okay, so this is really gonna be the way that we are going to approach parameter estimation as we go through the entire semester. And in fact, <clears throat> let's come back to the problem we have been studying, which is linear regression. And let's revisit this from the perspective of maximum likelihood um, <clears throat> estimation and figure out, you know, what that tells us about how to choose our beta coefficients. So <clears throat> this is what we're gonna do is we actually need now a, a random variable model for our data. So we're going to adopt this linear Gaussian model. And this is actually, hopefully you can see, this is essentially what we have been assuming in, in our uh, polynomial demo. And when we did the study of um, bias variance trade-off, we, we had a model, we, we called this the, this was like F of X in that case. Um, the true f of x, but this is also actually our f hat of x. Maybe I'll write that just to make sure. So this is like uh, f hat of x parameterized by beta. Okay, so this is hopefully a familiar thing. Um, and But what I'm writing here is actually like the entire, all the different training samples stacked together. And here we have all, each one of those rows of the X matrix contains all the features for the I sample. And then this is a vector of noises. So, you know, the first one of these epsilons affected the first training sample and so on. And uh, important uh, assumption we're gonna make now is that these epsilon I's are, independent, we've always been assuming they're independent, identically distributed, but now we're gonna assume that they're Gaussian with zero mean and sigma squared variance. So when we did the bias variance decomposition, we never needed to assume that they were Gaussian or from any distribution really, but now we're gonna assume, yes, they, these guys are Gaussian. Um, also another thing, when we write the model this way, we're assuming that we're using standardized data so that we don't have any intercept term and we, you know, beta zero equals zero. And therefore we don't need the A matrix here with the ones column appended. We can just use the X matrix. This just makes things a little bit simpler. Um, okay, so that's, this is the model for our training data. Um, and if we wanna view this just from, you know, let, let's say I wanna look at the i sample and Y, that would be yi. And if I want to look at on the other side of the equation, what is the i sample? I would extract the i row of this matrix, which is xi transpose. That would get multiplied by beta. This is like an inner product between xi and beta dot product. And then I would have the i epsilon i. So if we want to look at what's happening, you know, what is what is a statistical model for yi? Um, <clears throat> Let's be a little careful. So we're going to think of our features as fixed because this is 
feature data we've collected. So we're gonna condition on the features X. We're also gonna think of our parameters beta as just some deterministic thing that we're choosing. So we're not gonna think of them as random. So we're gonna condition on them just to enforce the idea that these are not random variables. Now, knowing that, and knowing that epsilon i are Gaussian with mean zero and variance sigma squared, what is the distribution of yi? What is the distribution of this? Any ideas? So Gaussian? The, yes, it is Gaussian. The key point is that we're treating this as deterministic. Okay, so here I have a Gaussian with zero mean, sigma squared. You can even visualize it. This is the PDF. What happens when I add this fixed constant to it in the picture? There will be some translation. Exactly, it just shifts it. Maybe I'll draw it um, again. It may be positive, it may, may be negative, but this is gonna be Xi transpose beta. I just shifted it a bit. And so now it's Gaussian. It has the same width or it has the same variance. It just has a different mean. And in particular, the mean is what? The mean is this guy, Xi transpose beta. Okay, so this, yi is a new random variable, which is Gaussian, with this mean, and with the same variance as epsilon i, which is sigma squared. Okay, so we, we can write that like this. The PDF of uh, evaluated yi, given x and beta, is Gaussian, where again, yi is just sort of the, the dummy variable that I'm I'm using to describe the, you know, this this is a, this is like yi. And then here we have this is showing the mean, which is xi transpose beta. This is showing the variance. Okay. The mean of yi is xi transpose times beta. Exactly. Exactly. This is the mean of yi because this has zero mean. So when you add up that fixed number, that becomes the mean. Okay, so hopefully convinced you that if I look at the i sample in this model, we have this probabilistic model for the i sample. It happens to be Gaussian. We know it's mean, we know it's variance. And also when you think about all the different samples, they're all Gaussian, they're all independent, they all have the same variance. Now their means will be a little different because every time you go to a new row, Xi changes, right? This matrix has different rows. So that means you'll have slightly different means as you go down, uh, as you go down these Ys. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so we're finally in a position to write out this is the likelihood. If we think about y and x is fixed and beta as the thing we're trying to choose, this is our likelihood function. As we know, this is gonna be the product of these individual scalar likelihoods with the individual yi's. We know now that they take this Gaussian form. Let's plug in the PDF for that Gaussian. So here you can see the variance sigma squared. Here you can see the mean uh, for the i sample. Otherwise, it's hopefully familiar exponentiation, negative, quadratic, and so on. <clears throat> and is everybody good so far? Okay, so um, <clears throat> now let's work on this product. So the key thing to remember with, okay, let's do step by step. So I'm going to take this to the nth power because I'm multiplying it times itself n times. So that's going to give me this. Now I'm going to take the product of all these exponential terms. So remember, if you have like Ea times Eb, this is 
e to the power a plus b, right? So in other words, if you take a product of exponentials, you get an exponentiated sum. So in other words, this product on the outside of the exponential becomes a sum on the inside of the exponential. And that sum is, of course, over i again, and that's what gives us this. <clears throat> And the last step is just to write it in a slightly more compact way, which is to remember that this sum of square terms is just the squared Euclidean norm of vector <clears throat> y matrix x beta like that. Okay, so we're getting closer. We have now a pretty concise expression for the likelihood function. <clears throat> And as I mentioned before, it's often more convenient to deal with a negative log likelihood. So let's see what happens. If I take the log of this on the in the numerator, I'm going to get so I'm, let's say let's take the log and then negate it. So I'm going to get this in the numerator, and then. Uh, if you take, here's another identity, log of A over B is log of A minus log of B. So what's going to happen now is I'm going to have uh, minus, but then I'm going to negate it with this. So it's going to turn into a plus of log, I'll write it natural log of this term, 2 pi sigma squared to the n over two power. Okay, so that's that's what this negative log likelihood is. That's the thing we're trying to maximize over beta. <clears throat> so when you look at this and you notice that the second term has no beta in it, you realize it's not involved in the maximization. So we can really, to maximize this, we just want to maximize the first term. Second of all, this one over two sigma squared is not gonna affect our maximization. It's gonna affect the maximum value, sure, but it's not gonna affect the maximizer, the value of beta that makes it largest. So basically we can get rid of that as well, at which point you see that the maximum likelihood estimate, oops, maximum likelihood estimate is nothing more than the minimum squared error solution. This is RSS. Okay, so this is exactly what we've been doing. This is what we did back in units one and two. At the time we started with this, we just said, this seems like a good idea, let's do it. And we derived you know, the expression for the betas. But now we're explaining why we're doing that. It's actually in some sense, the optimal thing to do when your data has a true model that's linear like this and is corrupted by noise that is additive and Gaussian. That's right, the big picture, part of the big picture is justifying what we've been doing until now with RSS. When we think about it this way, we realize, oh, okay, so if we are facing Gaussian noise, that's zero mean and some variance, then by doing this, we're actually finding the most likely parameters beta that fit our data. Okay, so that's kind of one powerful idea. The other powerful idea is maybe in some particular data set, we have reason to believe that our noise is not Gaussian. Maybe it has some other peculiarity to it, comes from another distribution. Maybe it's, for example, always positive or something. In that case, you would be right to question using least squares because you'd be like, but that's not right. That's not gonna be the most likely beta vector given what I know about the noise model. So this not only in some sense justifies why we've been doing RSS, but clarifies that that is a reasonable thing to do when your noise is zero mean and Gaussian, 
But if your noise is coming from another distribution and you really know that, you might want to consider something different than, you know, least squares estimation. Okay. And in fact, this is going to be what we do when we study classification. We're going to realize this idea does not work for classification, does not work well at all. So we're going to have to come up with a different model, and then we're going to redo the maximum likelihood at that point, and we're going to get a technique that works much better. Okay, so this is real big idea. And in fact, um, all of machine learning is sort of about coming up with a good model, and then in almost all cases using maximum likelihood to fit the parameters to that model. So this is like the standard approach. Okay. Um, any questions on, on this? Okay, so we will definitely be seeing this again. So not a big deal if you haven't absorbed every detail. But now we're gonna move just one step beyond and say, well, okay, so when we did this, we had no, we didn't use any prior belief about our beta parameters. But maybe, for example, someone tells us, I happen to know, you know, I'm an expert and I happen to know your betas should be really pretty close to zero. You shouldn't see any big values for beta. You can say, okay, I, I wanna incorporate that knowledge, but this alone is, has no way of incorporating that. So I need a slightly more um, complicated or maybe not complicated, but you know, slightly more um, sophisticated procedure. So this is where we get this notion of the MAP estimate, which is short for the maximum a posteriori estimation. <clears throat> and it has this definition. So let's just pause to look at this. In some sense, when you look at this, it almost makes more sense than maximum likelihood because this is the probability of beta given the data you've collected. It's just like saying, I wanna find the most probable value of beta given my data X and Y. Um, <clears throat> now, the thing is, as we'll see in a second, this requires you to have a random variable model on beta itself. Whereas over here, you don't need that. These betas that we've been working with here are purely deterministic. They're not random at all. They're just numbers we're trying to fit. But now, when we say the probability of beta, that only makes sense if beta is itself a random vector. Okay, so, but you know, maybe that's possible. Maybe someone says, I happen to know, or I happen to have a strong belief that my betas are Gaussian with mean zero and variance 0.1 or something. So I can combine that knowledge with the measurements Y and X that I've collected through this map procedure. That's what we're trying to do. And so we're just saying, what's the most probable beta given the data we've collected? Now, the thing is, we don't know this quantity directly. We just have to do some um, kind of juggling around to get this into a form that's usable. And for that, we're going to use something called Bayes' rule. Let me first write Bayes' rule in a simpler way. Um, I'll write it like this with some A and B. So probability of B given A, if you ever encounter probability of B given A, and you wish you could swap the conditioning, you wish you could express it in terms of A given B, because maybe you know that, but you don't know B given A, then you use Bayes' rule. Bayes' rule says that equals the probability of A given B times the probability of B divided by the probability of A. Okay, so this allows you to swap the order of the conditioning as long as you have these other so-called marginal distributions that just involve B alone or A alone. Okay, so this is Bayes' rule. And we're going to use a slightly more complicated version of Bayes' rule where you have this, but you just have a, a conditioning on X everywhere. So there's always an X. You're just, you're just, there's another thing X, and we're just always going to treat it as deterministic. 
So that's where, that's where we have this given X, given X, given X, given X. So that's, that's how this is changing to this. And I'm bringing in the X here just because um, it is possible to try to explain this all without the X, but you know we do have this X and um, when we work with our data and it's just good to acknowledge it's there and acknowledge that we're thinking about it as just a deterministic uh, quantity. So we're doing that with this conditioning argument. Okay, so that's, that's how we got this. Um, and the reason why this is attractive is notice that this is the likelihood. This is exactly the thing we were working with with maximum likelihood. And this is right in the previous page. So this is something that we often know. Um, what about this next term? What does it mean, the, the probability density of beta given X? So beta are the coefficients in our model that predicts Y from X, and X are just the features alone. So I would argue that, you know, beta is all about going from X to Y. And here, if you just tell me X alone without any Y at all, it doesn't tell me anything about beta. Beta is all about going from X to Y. So if you tell me either X alone or Y alone, uh, it, it's, it really doesn't inform me about beta at all. So in other words, we can just think of this probability beta given X as just probability of beta itself. Okay. And, then, um, and then that's the idea. So we wanna maximize this probability beta given Y X. And we now said, we can rewrite that this way in terms of this likelihood we know. Um, and then this is this is where our prior information, this is if someone says, I happen to know beta is Gaussian with a mean of 0.1, or, you know, or whatever it is, we can incorporate that now. This is exactly where we can stick it in. So we want to maximize or find the maximizer of this whole thing. But now notice that the denominator is not gonna affect our maximization. It acts just like a scaling term. And so actually we can just forget about this. All we need to do is maximize the product of the likelihood and the prior. Okay, so in maximum likelihood estimation, it's like you have, you have this problem. And in map estimation, all you do is you stick in the prior knowledge, uh, you, know, you, you multiply the likelihood by the prior. So just to sit back and reflect, the likelihood tells us how well beta, our, this is our hypothesis of the true beta, how well that hypothesis agrees with the data X and Y, whereas the prior tells us how well beta agrees with any belief that we may have had before we collected any measurements. That's why it's called prior. It's like before you measure. And posterior means after you measure. So the posterior takes in the prior knowledge as well as the measurements themselves and fuses them into how much do you know after you've done the measurement. So those are the three things, prior, likelihood, and posterior. By the way, this, this is called the posterior. The posterior. Uh, density in this case. <clears throat> okay, so so this is this is uh just allows us to go beyond ML and bring in additional knowledge that we may have had about our parameters beta even before we collected any data. Let me highlight this. Okay. And in just a moment we'll see that this is in fact one way to think of what we've been doing when we do regularized these squares, uh, like lasso and ridge, those are just instances of map. Before we go there, are there any questions and anything so far? Can you expand on the prior? I'm struggling to conceptualize what type of information that would be if we don't have information from X and Y. So it would be this, if, if someone tells you um, the prediction coefficients you should expect to see should not be gigantic. You know, if you see numbers like a million, that's not right. The numbers should be 
around zero, you know, plus and minus in, in the region of zero to minus one to one shouldn't be much bigger than that. If you happen to know that, that would be prior information. Another kind of prior information might be um, the your betas uh, should be positive. And more than that, you know, maybe there's there's particular particular shape to how positive they should be. Maybe they should come from this sort of distribution. So it's, you know, it's it's likely mo more likely that they're small and positive than they're large and positive. So those are all different kind of forms the prior could manifest as. Or another one could be your betas should be integers and nothing else. Um, they, they can never be non-integer values. Um, these are just different examples. <clears throat> okay, so, um, and whether you have this prior information or not really depends on the context, depends on what problem you're trying to solve. Okay, all right. Um, <clears throat> Any other questions? We'll see uh, some concrete examples now going forward. Okay. So now I'm gonna try to convince you that regularized linear regression is just map estimation. So here's what we have from the previous page, mac, arg max of the product of the likelihood and some prior density on beta. And as we know, you can sneak in a negative log and if you change the max to min. And again, we're doing that just to make things simpler. And now if you have the log of product AB, this is the log of A plus the log of B. So this log of the product, we can write this as minus log of the likelihood minus log of the prior. And now let's, come back to this negative log likelihood. We saw a couple pages ago that when we have this linear Gaussian model, and you know, so that's this model where the epsilon vectors is a vector of independent Gaussian noises with mean zero and some variance. Then the negative log likelihood we derived is equal to this plus some constant. And this is a constant with respect to beta term. So beta is what we really care about maximizing. So that constant is not going to affect our maximization. So in other words, I can plug this into here. And now we're saying this is our math problem. Let's make one other slight simplification. If I'm minimizing this, I can, it's, a, it's the same as minimizing two sigma squared times that. And so what I can do is I can multiply both terms by two sigma squared, which will cancel this and move the two sigma squared to the second term. And now when you look at it, we've just rearranged things so that we're minimizing, we're finding the minimizer of RSS plus a penalty, if you will, on beta. The particular penalty we're using is, you know, takes the form of the log of the prior scaled by minus two sigma squared. Okay, in the previous slide, why is P Y given X independent of beta in the last equation? Um, so the way we got to here, so the last equation is just, that's coming from this. And the way we got here is from this expression. So this is the simple version, the simplest version of Bayes' rule where you just have B and A with some random variables. And if you notice that you get A given B and then B alone and A alone. So this is just the way Bayes' rule works. So you have A alone in the bottom, B alone on the top, and then this conditional one here. So I said in order to go from here to here, all I'm doing is I'm sticking in, I'm just saying there exists some other deterministic variables and then I'm going to I'm going to put the, those x's after the conditioning everywhere. So that's that's kind of how these x's showed up. And yeah, and, and after that we got this. And when we did the arg max, this x just like a, a beta independent scaling. So maximizing ma maximizing this whole thing over beta is no different than maximizing the numerator over beta. 
This is just a fixed scaling, fixed with beta. So that's why we could get rid of it in, in just to simplify things. Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, all right. So, so finally, what, what we've seen here is that when we combine map estimation with the linear Gaussian model, that, that gives us the likelihood term in map. And then we have basically this regularized RSS minimization problem. And we've seen two examples of that, two very specific examples of of these terms. And now we can actually reverse engineer the probabilistic assumptions that would give us ridge or lasso. So that's the next week thing we can do. And then we can understand ridge and lasso as instances of beta map under particular prior beliefs on the beta coefficients. So let's First, take a look at, um, so this is this is the equation from the previous page. Let's first imagine that we have a prior belief where our beta coefficients are ID Gaussian with zero mean and variance V. So this is nothing more than saying um, the beta J are centered at zero with standard deviation square root of V. And V is just some number, it can be anything. But you know, if I have a particular belief that these are really close to zero, I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose V really small. You know, maybe I think they're just not absolutely gigantic. Maybe I can allow them to be plus or minus 10. Then I could choose V as 100. So you know anything is possible here, but the main point is I'm just saying these things are centered around zero. They they shouldn't be absolutely gigantic, negative or positive. That's that's what this is saying. So if that's our prior belief on the individual beta j's and they're all iid, then our prior belief on the collection, the vector beta j, is just going to be the the product of those individual things. So this is just the Gaussian distribution for zero mean and variance b. So when I take the natural log of this, then okay, this is gonna turn into a sum. It's gonna kill this exponential, kill this minus sign. And you're gonna have the, this sum is gonna be over here and you're gonna get the Euclidean norm on the beta vector squared. And then this stuff is gonna give you a constant, but it's a constant in beta. So it's not really gonna affect our maximization. And so finally, this term becomes this. And now you can recognize this. This is exactly ridge regression for a very particular version of alpha, where alpha is sigma squared over V. So you can see as V gets larger, that's like using a smaller alpha and so on, smaller weight on the regularization. So this gives us an interpretation that when we're doing ridge, regre ridge regression, it's equivalent to saying, yeah, maximize the training, or sorry, minimize training RSS, but keep in mind that the betas should not be too far from the origin. That's that's exactly what ridge regression does. Questions on this interpretation? <clears throat> okay, we can do the same thing for lasso. Imagine that the belief or prior belief on beta is that they are IID Laplacian variables with shift parameter zero and scale parameter lambda. It turns out that the, that PDF looks like this. It's very similar to the Gaussian, but it uses the absolute value instead of the square. And then the normalization constant needs to be a little different too, just to make sure that it integrates to one. Um, but anyway, this is now a product because we have all our different betas. And now when you take the natural log of beta, the next, the, sorry, the, yeah, the natural log of beta, that will kill this exponential and you'll get the L1 norm. You have the sum of the absolute values. 
this gives the constant. And now this is a constant respect to beta, so we don't have to worry about it in this, um, <clears throat> this minimization. And we can stick that in for this term. And now we get lasso. With a particular version or particular value of the, the weight alpha. Okay, so lasso can be thought of as Laplacian. Laplacian distribution kind of looks like this. It's um it's peaked and it has heavier tails than the Gaussian. Gaussian tails, um they they go down really fast. Laplacian tails do not go down as fast. So that means Laplacian allows larger values of beta, but this peak at the origin says it really thinks that beta is often exactly zero. But once in a while, it can be really large. So that's, that's where you get this uh, L1 norm and lasso. Okay. So, um, okay, so just to summarize then, try to wrap up quickly. Um, supervised machine learning can be framed as statistical parameter estimation. To do this, we come up with some probabilistic model relating our labels, features, and unknown parameters. It relates the training features and model parameters of training data. Um, for example, this could be the linear Gaussian model we saw. And then for maximum likelihood estimation, we maximize that thing over theta or equivalently minimize it over negative, the negative log of it. In doing so, we have, we're bringing in no prior belief about theta. On the other hand, we could model theta itself as a random variable and we could maximize the probability of beta given the data we collected. Equivalently, we could minimize the negative log likelihood minus the log prior and beta. And this does employ a prior belief on theta. So the very last thing I want to get to, because it's used in the lab for this unit, <clears throat> is an extension of linear regression that we can use when we have more than one target. So until now, we focused on scalar value target. So you know, we're just predicting one thing like miles per gallon. What if we want to jointly predict several things from the same features? So let's say that there are gonna be K, capital K different things we're gonna to wanna to predict. So that means for the i sample in our data, we actually have K different targets. Let's stick them in a row vector and call that YI transpose. <clears throat> Similarly, the features that we always have for the i sample, they're gonna stuck, be stuck in this row vector XI transpose. And now we're gonna to try to predict all these things from these features. Doing so requires that we are gonna have different vectors of beta. So this first vector of beta coefficients will be in charge of predicting the first target, the second one in charge of predicting the second target, all the way to the last one predicting the last target. So that's how we're gonna extend it. We're gonna have different vectors that we're gonna learn all together. Because there's no capital beta, uh, we're just gonna call this matrix B bold B matrix. So this is going to have um, K columns. And remember that each one of these, there's there's D, uh, actually D plus one features in this case, because we have the one there. So D plus one rows, K columns. That's the size of this guy. So that's, that's the extension we're talking about now. Coefficient matrix B, vector of targets. And it's really not that different. Um, so in terms of some of the quantities, we we stack those those rows, those sample rows all together. We get a sample matrix, capital Y. This is the same A matrix we've been working with. And here's the B vector. So basically our new model is matrix Y. It's approximately it's a matrix A times matrix B. And the other stuff, that's the main idea. Um, if we want to think about this as a linear Gaussian model so that we can think about maximum likelihood and all that, then essentially we're going to have a matrix of noises. The, those noises will all be independent, identically distributed, all zero mean uh, variance sigma squared. 
when we talk about ridge regression, we know we want to penalize the squared terms of all of our, uh, our Bs or betas. So that's what we're going to do. The only thing we have to be careful about is it's a notational thing. Um, we have to use what's called the Frobenius norm. This is because if you put a little two there, or if you thought, I'm just going to use the standard norm on matrices, it's not the Euclidean, it's not similar to the Euclidean vector norm. It actually ends up taking the largest singular value of the matrix. Now, if you don't know what singular values are, that's fine. We'll actually talk about them later in the course, but um, it's it's a different thing. And so we can't use, we can't uh, write nothing there, or write a two there. We have to use this Frobenius norm. Conceptually, it's exactly like what we were doing before. It's just notationally, it's different. <clears throat> so that's ridge regression. For lasso, it turns out, the matrix one norm is conceptually the same as the as the vector one norm. It's just the sum of all the absolute values of the coefficients. So we can do that as usual. But basically, these are this is the the ridge and lasso problem that we're going to solve. And finally, the nice the nice thing is that sklearn all of its linear regression methods work without any modification. All you have to do is give them a vector y, vector x. And that's all you have to do. You just have to make sure that, of course, you know they're oriented the right way, how it expects. It expects to see samples in one direction and features in the other direction and so on. But as long as you give them the matrices in the right way, it does its stuff and it will calculate for you this matrix of betas, um, either for ridge or for lasso or plane uh, linear regression. So that's that's it for this unit. Are there any Questions on this last part here? Okay, looks like no questions on that. Um, and um, any questions on, on anything here at all? Anything we talked to today? Um, and if people need to go, it's absolutely fine. I apologize for going over time today. Um, okay, looks like, looks like no questions. Great. Um, Okay, very good. So, uh, so the very last thing I want to say is that um, I know it's really bad timing, um, especially with me not being able to lecture today uh, <clears throat> live and, and on Wednesday, but I'm going to be out of town at a research conference all next week. And it turns out that the lecture time here in Columbus is not a time that I can get free of uh, for next week. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to post some pre-recorded lectures that go through Unit 5. We'll be working with Unit 5 classification next week. Um, and I apologize, I won't be able to hold office hours either for the same reason, but I'll try to uh, monitor the discussion page if you have any questions. Um, Kai Ying will, of course, be there for all the office hours. Um, but you guys will be on your own next week uh, with regard to the lectures. Um, I'm probably going to post the lectures I recorded last year because they're essentially identical uh, to what I would have wanted to lecture for you guys. And so um, so you'll have you know similar presentation style, just not be able to ask questions during the lecture. So apologize again for that. But after next week, we should re be back to usual where I can lecture in person to you for the rest of the semester. So sorry about these interruptions. Um, and there's no other questions. Um, have a good weekend, and I will see you guys in a week. <clears throat>